This video assumes familiarity with previous videos I've produced on the impact of Jewish mysticism on Islam, particularly the last video, which was on the mystical background to Surah 20, and another video called Muhammad the Mystic and the Boy Under the Blanket. That video details the strange encounter of Muhammad and a Jewish boy mystic. Now, we will describe further developments in Jewish mystical traditions to take an in-depth look at a curious detail in the story of Muhammad and Ibn Sayyid. As noted in the last video, Ezekiel's Merkava shows up at Sinai as well, but that's not all. In a rabbinic source dating likely to the 3rd or 4th century, we find the Merkava at the Red Sea. When Pharaoh had gone through all his weapons, God began to exalt himself over him. Wicked one, he said, have you got wind? Have you got a cherub? Have you got wings? God detached them from between the wheels of the Merkava and hurled them upon the sea. In the same way the Israelites detached the Merkava ox in the previous video, God is portrayed as detaching his weapons, such as a cherub and wind, and hurling them at Pharaoh. But the Egyptians had some unique features in their army as well. Each Egyptian would say to his horse, Yesterday you wouldn't let me drag you to be watered, and now you're drowning me in the sea. The horse would reply, He has hurled in the sea. Look what is in the sea. The celestial realms do I see in the sea. And another tradition further clarifies what was in the sea. When the Israelites came to the sea, those children were there, and they saw God at the sea, literally in the sea, by Yom. In another Haggadah, Moses himself saw God in the sea. What's the significance of all this? We've talked before about Hekelot literature. This is basically an instruction manual for mystics wanting to ascend to God's throne room. And part of those traditions were modeled after this supposed theophany at the Red Sea. Do you remember the water episode from previous videos? At the gateway to the sixth palace, the hopeful mystic sees the polished marble of the palace, which looks like water. If he says, water, water, then he's exposed as a liar and a fraud. We saw how these traditions made it into the Talmud and then the Quran as a test applied to the Queen of Sheba. She was told to enter the palace and thought she saw water, but it was actually smooth glass. She was thus exposed as an evildoer. Why does what we're going to talk about in this video revolve so much around water? We can start back in Genesis. In ancient Near Eastern terms, we begin with watery chaos in Genesis 1 that God brings into order to make the earth habitable. Sometimes creation is portrayed as God fighting against the forces of chaos. What God does for Israel at the Red Sea can be seen as a new creation. Indeed, creation terminology is used in the Exodus account. But the waters of the Red Sea are there as well. And if the water represents chaos, then God must have appeared at the Red Sea to fight against it. But how is this all connected to Ezekiel and the Merkava? Well, we have water in Genesis, Exodus, and Ezekiel. Remember where Ezekiel was when he had his vision. These were the living creatures that I, Ezekiel, saw underneath the God of Israel by the Gavar Canal, and I knew that they were cherubim. Now let's do some rabbinic wordplay. You could read Genesis 3.24 as saying, more ancient than the Garden of Eden were cherubim. Genesis Rabbah, commenting on the verse, connects it to the cherubim in Ezekiel 10.20. More ancient meaning angels were created earlier than the Garden of Eden, so it is written, this was the Chayah that I saw beneath the God of Israel at the river Kavar, and I knew that they were cherubim. This works especially well not only because of the cherubim in each verse, but because Kavar can also be taken to mean long ago, recalling the wordplay in Genesis 3.24. Thus, Ezekiel was by the canal, or river, of long ago. We've previously discussed how rabbis will connect various biblical passages on the basis of a single word, and an unusual or inappropriate meaning of the word at that. This is another example. But now we see how all of these concepts are connected, in rabbinic thought at least. We've previously seen that God was in the Red Sea. Remember the talking horse which would reply, He has hurled in the sea. Look, what is in the sea? The celestial realms do I see. And when the Israelites came to the sea, they saw God at the sea, or literally, in the sea. But what does this mean, theologically, for God to somehow be in the sea? The meaning becomes ominous. Similar to the belief that we talked about in the last video, where you could gain control over something by using the dust of its footprints, the rabbis appear to hold a belief somewhat similar to the Gnostics, where the essence of something 
reflected in water, can be trapped and even harnessed. Thus, when the Merkava appears in the water, the upper realms are merged into the lower. Some rabbis perceived in Ezekiel's vision hints of a fearful ambiguity of good and evil within God himself, and preferred not to entertain the thoughts toward which these hints pointed. The paradox of the Merkava in the waters points in the same direction. It brings the upper world into the netherworld. It makes the distinction between above and below insignificant. It turns the Merkava, like any reflection in water, into part of the fluid and shapeless chaos that God once had to defeat. There is even an anti-Merkava in Jewish sources describing the Shekinah above and the Shekinah below. The feet of Chayot are described as being in the lowest earth, and the Merkava itself is placed in the watery depths. We see now that there is theological ambiguity and tension in how the rabbinic sources conceived of the Merkava and the water. In the divine, there is also anti-divine. In God, there is also chaos. We've seen similar ambiguity in Islamic sources as well, where both Allah's and Satan's thrones are above the water. And now back to the story of Muhammad and the boy mystic, Ibn Sayyid. This story is explicitly rooted in Jewish mysticism, and it's also extremely embarrassing for Muhammad. Recall the mystical setting in the Talmud among the speech of palm trees, which reminds me of the talking trees in the Hadith. There we have Muhammad sneaking through them, trying to spy on the boy who is covered in a sheet, clearly recalling the traditional practice of Merkava mystics. But Muhammad wasn't too stealthy. He was caught by the boy's mother. Also recall that Muhammad tested the boy's psychic powers in the usual way. He asked the boy to tell him what he was thinking. The boy, apparently reading Muhammad's mind, let us know that Muhammad occasionally thought of something other than sex with nine-year-old girls. The boy revealed Muhammad's thoughts. It is just smoke, allegedly referring to Surah 44. And now we get to our specific point of interest. Muhammad poses another question to the boy, saying, Do you bear testimony to the fact that I am the messenger of Allah. The boy returned the question. Muhammad is indecisive at this point and simply gives an answer generic enough to be worthless and then eagerly questions the boy again. I affirm my faith in Allah and his angels and his books. And what do you see? The boy replied, I see the throne over water. Muhammad said, you see the throne of Iblis upon the water. David Halperin sums it up nicely. Ibn Sayyid's vision is rooted in the Jewish Merkava tradition. Like the Midrashic Ezekiel, he sees the throne and the chayot amid the waters. But Muhammad's response, like so much else of his teaching, is also rooted in Judaism, in the rabbi's perception that the presence of the Merkava in the waters is an ominous clue to the nature of its occupant. Ibn Sayyid, therefore, must be having a vision of Iblis, enthroned in the sea with his chayot. Whether it's a palace that looks like water, Muhammad covering himself up with a blanket during his revelations, a mind-reading boy mystic, talking trees or divine ambiguity, once again, some otherwise very puzzling stories in the Islamic sources can be explained entirely against the background of Jewish mysticism. I'll see you next time.